another Exodus study, number 13, Exodus chapter 8, verses 16 to 32. We want to give out a hillbilly holla to Brother Charlie O'Dell down in Parkersburg, West Virginia. And uh, we just know that Charlie knows exactly what it means to be a hillbilly because he's surrounded by hillbillies. <laughs> uh, all right going to get right into this study. I'm going to cover verses 16 to 32, Lord willing. And uh, we'll open with a word of prayer. Father, we thank you, Lord, for our time in the book. We thank you for those listening to the many friends and uh, brothers and sisters in Christ that we have been able to meet, been able to minister to and minister with. Uh, all because of the open door that the internet has provided along with the radio ministry and the local church ministry of course uh, being the base of all these things and so we had just ask Lord that you'd help everyone who's watching and help me we want to learn your word we pray these things in Jesus name Amen um, <clears throat> go ahead mention before we do jump into the study I got a I think it's a funny shirt on um, I saw this is a meme somebody put out there on social media and you, if you can see it it's a van and I'll, I'll describe it for those who aren't able to see it uh, listening by radio and we also have visually impaired folks watching and the it's a van and on the back of these vans people uh, they'll put uh, um, uh, stick figures a lot of times and sometimes it can be other things to show the man and the woman and the children and so if they have their family of five they'd have man woman and uh, say two little boys and a little girl the little girl stick figures look like they have a skirt on with a bow in the hair and the little boy stick figure or look like he has a ball cap on or something and of course if it's a liberals car it could be two men <laughs> two women um, but uh, and they also uh, the legit ones will have uh, little puppies or kittens for to represent their pets and I saw this thing it's uh, two bears looking at the back of the van with all these little stick figures and one bears look at the other and says hey look a menu <laughs> Uh, the reason why that's funny is because there's truth behind it. Truth is funny. And the funniest things are based in truth. And they tell you they're, they're discouraging people from doing this on their cars because they say it tips off criminals and people. Especially like when you have the single mothers. Um, just have a woman with a couple kids or a couple pets or something. A single woman, single mother. Um, and those are the most... Um, uh, usually the most uh, susceptible to being unprotected and easier targets along with the elderly just fact of life folks don't get mad at me I'm not a misogynist or a chauvinist or whatever you want to call me I'm just a, a Bible believer who believes in speaking the truth so anyway that's uh, that's the message behind this is kind of make you think about that let's get right into our study number 13 as I said and we've gone over the first two plagues the uh, water turned into blood and that uh, was a smack in the face to Hopi the god of the Nile for Egypt and uh, proved he was nothing compared to Jehovah God and now they're they're nothing in the sense that they these gods are just natural things water rivers whatever um, frogs come out of the Nile the Nile River river is not a living entity but we do have to remember that Paul says later that those who sacrifice to these gods are sacrificing to devils so while the God itself is based on some material thing that isn't a God behind that the motive and the spirit behind that is a devil and so God is cutting these gods down one at a time of course the second one was the frogs from the Nile and uh, that's Heket the goddess of fertility and water and uh, represented by the head of a frog 
And so now we come to plague number three, one that will make you itch just thinking about it. Lice from the dust or the earth. And that's Geb, uh, the uh, Eg Egyptian god of the earth. And so he's the god of the dirt. And um, that's in verse 16. Let's go ahead and pick up and read there. And the Lord said unto Moses, Say unto Aaron, Stretch out thy rod and smite the dust of the land, that it may become lice throughout all the land of Egypt. That had to be a mess. Lice are also called nits, N-I-T-S, in English. <laughs> and the skeptics and the scholars complain that a better translation would be gnat. <laughs> uh, nits or gnats. Reminds you of Matthew 23, 24, doesn't it? Ye blind guides which strain at a gnat and swallow a camel. The point is being missed by these gnat straining scholars and skeptics. Lice um, knits, they'll attach eggs, and I don't have enough hair to have lice, I don't think. And I keep mine either shaved or very short. Um, I'm forehead bald, you know, so uh, it just, I just don't like, the, I definitely, the, I started shaving years ago, I think it was 2004, when I looked in the mirror and caught myself doing a little bit of a comb over like that. And I thought, whoa. <laughs> I'm not doing that. I got my all I had was a beard trimmer, and I used a beard trimmer to shave the rest of my ha hair off. And uh, went into work that next day. <laughs> I didn't have any facial hair, by the way. And uh, so the, the people thought I lost my mind. And then um, I bought a. Uh, I know this doesn't have anything to do with the. Uh, um, study directly but just wait and listen you'll hear the connection so I went out and got a regular old razor and used shaving cream and man I'll tell you that was one of the most difficult things trying to shave my head and so I went out and saved up a little money and bought a real nice electric razor and that worked much better and the reason I mentioned that is because um, they do have shampoos and things, but those, that stuff's toxic. And so most of the time when you got little boys that get this stuff, or men, they'll just shave their head. And of course back then they didn't have electric racers. Um, so you can imagine what kind of a, uh, when every male and female in Egypt has lice, what a mess that is. And they, they attach eggs at the base of the hair near the scalp and then after that egg hatches, I know it's going to make you itch thinking about it, but this is just important to understand. Um, the, there's a leftover, um, the l little eggshell, it, it turns a kind of a yellowish color, so if you have dark hair, it really stands out. And um, that's usually what people see when they realize somebody's got lice. If a parent realizes their kid has lice or the nurse at a school or something, sees it it's usually that little leftover part of the egg and so um, you know lice in our day in America in Ohio where I live lice is seen as a, a sign of not being clean and that's really only true some of the time um, now it does seem to originate normally with someone who's living in squalor uh, someone who um, you know just doesn't have the best hygiene that's the truth but it easily spreads so you have some kid who's clean mommy uh, make sure the kid has a bath and mom and dad make sure they have good clean clothes decent clothes and and all that but all they have to do is play with a child you know kids wrestle around and everything and if that other kid has lice they can get it that way they can put on the kids coat and hat kids do it all the time sometimes by accident sometimes on purpose um, and adults the same thing you can go to a department store and try on a hat throw on a coat and if you got a lot of hair you could get lice I always I'm in the habit when I look at a hat or a coat man I mean I look at it and shake it and I only I rarely try the stuff on if I'm gonna buy one I will but I'm very careful, as careful as I can be. So any close contact with the source with lice, you can get it. 
So in a, uh, modern, modern America today, it really doesn't always have to do with hygiene. And that's a sad thing that it's embarrassing when a kid in, in a school or a church or whatever is sent home because he or she has lice. It can be just devastating. Um, but in this case, everybody's going to get it. <laughs> Verse 17 says, And they did so. For Aaron stretched out his hand with his rod and smote the dust of the earth, and it became lice in man and in beast. I mean, everything with hair. <laughs> All the dust of the land became lice throughout all the land of Egypt. Now, you might think, why lice? And there's really a twofold answer. We already mentioned, number one, it's to slap down this god of the earth, the dirt god, Geb. Um, but the second thing is, this also demonstrates, as we shall see um, uh, by the confession of the magicians in a moment, that Jehovah God as creator is superior to any of these gods, even if you believe they exist. And of course, he's superior because they don't even exist. But to those who even believe they exist, it was clear to them, all right, Geb may exist, but he's no match for Jehovah. And uh, we, it says in verse 17, the dust became lice. Now, um, that's not even possible outside of the true God. <laughs> Let's read verse 18. It says, And the magicians did so um, with their enchant enchantments to bring forth lice, but they could not. So there were lice upon man and upon beast, but it couldn't be duplicated by the magicians. So right there, God is establishing himself as the only true and only sovereign God. Verse 19 continues and says, Then the magician said unto Pharaoh, This is the finger of God. And Pharaoh's heart was hardened, and he hearkened not unto them as the Lord had said. So, bam, right there. <laughs> this is the finger of God. Um, the magicians confess that only the true God, the God, Jehovah God, could create life out of non-living matter. So what does man do? Man sees that he cannot, no other God can, create um, life. So he invents the Big Bang, the completely unscientific and impossible doctrine of spontaneous generation, and the doctrine of natural selection. Now let me stop there just to mention that we believe in adaptation. We believe that within species um, that there are certain things that can change and species and kinds of animals can adapt and you know and you go to one area where a bird's beak it may be longer and another area where it's shorter because of the necessity of needing a longer beak on one place in one place where they didn't in the other. But it's still a bird. And there's no evidence of natural selection resulting in one kind of animal turning into another kind of animal. It's just not there. But this, it's ne uh, a necessity for man to get around this truth that we just saw in this text. That God alone can make life out of non-living matter. So he spends billions of dollars trying to find life on Mars on different asteroids. Um, I saw this in the news today. Uh, we're in June 2018 when we're recording this. And the Japanese have sent up the Hayabusa 2 craft to uh, rendezvous with Ryugu, an asteroid. Now, the idea behind this is that they think that it may be on a collision course with Earth. And so they're looking at uh, ways to possibly throw it off course and keep it from running into the earth. Now, wouldn't it be something that you read about the, in, in the Bible about these mountains, th something like a mountain coming down out of the sky, out of um, the heavens, and crashing into the earth? Wouldn't it be something if they're up there messing around and they put one of these, they boink, hit one of them, and boink, it hits another one, and then that one comes down to the earth during the tribulation? <laughs> but anyway, it's all in an effort 
to play God, and they don't. They're also taking, um, scooping up samples, and they have a special capsule that's going to come back with those samples, and they're always doing this not only to just find out what these things are made of and to confirm their guesswork and everything. They would love to find little life forms so that they could claim, oh, here we are, the seeds of evolution, and that sort of thing. Um, every, just listen to the reports about Mars. It's all about, just a couple of weeks ago, they claimed to find um, some kind of chemical or material that could be part of the building block that might be found in life. <laughs> now peel back that onion, and you see that it means nothing. They didn't find life. And they didn't find anything close to life, but they found something that might be involved in or included in the final form if there was life there, which there's not. So um, they, they, and they post these headlines that suggest they found life, and they didn't. And then later they clarify or even rescind those headlines, but they do it, you know, uh, in an obscure place, uh, some science journal no one will read, and maybe section D, page 14 of a newspaper or whatever. Um, so they leave that impression to, in people's minds that we're, we're finding evidence of life outside of Earth and, and we're not. So uh, the bottom line is we're being conned. And uh, I have to say this before moving on. No, that does not mean the, the Earth is flat. <laughs> it doesn't mean that um, every picture that comes back from um, these space explorations is fake. Um, computer generated uh, images, do, that doesn't mean they're fake images. Um, your phone is produces computer generated images of your family when you take a picture. It doesn't mean they're fake. And it doesn't mean that every bit of data that NASA does come up with is fake. What it means is, that you have to look at it and, and examine it and test it and get at the truth of the matter. Romans 1.20 says, For the invisible things of him from the creation of the world are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without excuse. So it means that we haven't been duped for millennia, and uh, we haven't been believed this big lie about the earth being a globe. It is a globe. The lie is behind where did it come from and where are we going? Is there a creator or did the earth get here by accident? Not whether or not it's a globe. Uh, I just had to say that because I could just see someone saying, oh yeah, he's, see, he's saying that we're being conned. We're being conned in the interpretation of the thing. The reality is real, but the interpretation is false. As we move on now to verse 20, and it says, And the Lord said unto Moses, Rise up early in the morning, and stand before Pharaoh. Lo, he cometh forth to the water, and say unto him, Thus saith the Lord, Let my people go, that they may serve me. And verse 21, let's continue. Else if thou wilt not let my people go, behold, I will send swarms of flies upon thee, and upon thy servants, and upon thy people, and into thy houses, and the houses of the Egyptians shall be full of swarms of flies, and also the ground whereon they are. So uh, the fourth plague is the swarm of flies. And that would smack down Kepri, K-H-E-P-R-I is the spelling I found, um, the god of creation, the movement of the sun, and um, they worshipped the dung beetle. Um, the, and they represented the Kepri, this God with the face or the head of a dung beetle. Um, a dung beetle is the word dung. It's a poop eating <laughs> beetle. And it's just funny to think about the fact they worshiped a God represented by this poop eating dung beetle. Um, if you want to see something funny, go on YouTube and search out Kung Fu Dung Beetles. It's a BBC clip, just a few minutes long, but it's, it's uh, be a great homeschool resource there. Pretty funny. So the term flies, when you talk about flies, we, we always hear where I'm from, we think of house flies. But it refers to any insect that flies, including the house fly, the horse fly, the dragon fly, the fire fly, um, blow flies, mosquitoes, gnats, 
um, um, midges, fruit flies, etc. And it's uh, likely that even this plague was not a swarm of just one particular fly. It was just flies, the swarm of flies, which would be these insects that fly and could have been some or all of the above and and folks I believe that it would have included things like the Midas fly that thing I've seen a picture of it it's about the size of my two fingers there with wings on it you take your index and middle finger together and hold it up I think that's the scout the way the scouts hold their fingers up and put wings on that sucker and then imagine that thing flying around landing on you and some of these things bite and sting and uh, I just it's not, that's just something I hope I never have to experience is a swarm of flies especially big ones and ones that bite and sting in verse 22 we continue it says I will sever in that day the land of Goshen in which my people dwell that no swarms of flies shall be there to the end thou mayest know that I am the Lord in the midst of the earth so he's going to separate out his people Israel here and that leaves you with the uh, thought that wait a minute then he didn't previously verse 23 continues and I will put a division between my people and thy people tomorrow shall this sign be so God's making a point to separate out the Jews the Hebrews at this point they're not called Jews called Hebrews at this point they'll be later called Jews after uh, they um, end up in um, the promised land <clears throat> and the um, difference is said to be those in Goshen because that's where all the Hebrews are living they're forced to live there they're, that's the original ghetto um, Jewish ghetto and um, this will not only separate the people of Jehovah but will also humiliate those worshiping this poop fly god Kepre and also seems to indicate that the Hebrews had suffered from um, the plagues previously the uh, water turning to uh, blood and the frogs and uh, the lice I mean, um, he doesn't say anything about um, the Jews being protected during those plagues. And I've read a lot on that. I know there's some people who try to say, well, maybe just didn't mention it. But my response is just, you know, they say, well, why would God allow the Jews to suffer these those things like the Egyptians? And my answer is because they weren't perfect. They weren't a... a you know glorified race they were still sinners and just like you and I we are saved but we still suffer the results of the fall we still suffer uh, illnesses hardships betrayal we our own fail failings and failures um, and yet we're also spared uh, I, I've talked about this just recently again with uh, some folks we had over at the house you know, and when we get to heaven, one of the things I think is going to be fascinating is how many times God spared us from suffering. But there's times he allows us to go through it. And it appears that that's what he did here with the Jews and up until this plague, the swarms of flies. Verse 24, And the Lord did so, and there came a grievous swarm of flies into the house of Pharaoh and into his servant's house, houses and into all the land of Egypt the land was corrupted by reason of the swarms of flies why because they the, most of these flies they'll eat and regurgitate and they pick up you know uh, poop and it's <laughs> go on your food that's why people hate when flies land on their food and uh, I've been in a couple of cases where the flies were really heavy for some reason uh, the first year we moved out here that first fall, man, there was so many flies, and I killed. I'm not kidding you. I counted. <laughs> I just, it's, I'm sorry if you think that's weird, but I saw so many flies. I'm saying, I'm gonna see how many of these I kill. 
I started counting. I got over 3,000 flies in one week. I'm not kidding you with a fly swatter. My wife's a witness. And then, of course, we got fly paper and stuff later, and, and uh, they've been cut way back since then. I think I depleted a good portion of the fly um, uh, race. <laughs> but uh, it's bad, though. But, it, but what I experienced, that's nothing compared to what's going on here. It would have been maddening. Uh, and Pharaoh appears to relent and uh, wants them to sacrifice, but he, he wants them to stay in Goshen. Verse 25 says, And Pharaoh called for Moses and for Aaron and said, Go ye sacrifice to your God in the land. Verse 26, And Moses said, It is not meet so to do, for we shall sacrifice the abomination of the Egyptians to the Lord our God. Um, Lo, shall we sacrifice the abomination of the Egyptians before their eyes, and will they not stone us? Remember, being a uh, shepherd was considered unclean because they thought that uh, this was an unclean um, uh, occupation. And so Moses brings up this um, legitimate reason for not just sacrificing right here in Goshen. And, you know, God had told him he, they can't. they got to go outside. And this was to get them to the promised land eventually anyway. Verse uh, 27 says, uh, Moses is continuing. He says, we will go three days journey into the wilderness and sacrifice to the Lord our God as he shall command us. Now, this three days journey is about 18 to 20 miles. And with a crowd this size, it would probably be less than that. Um, but as we mentioned back in uh, chapter 5, um, this would give them three days journey and then they'd have one day to sacrifice and three days back if if Pharaoh expected them to come back the reality is that it would give them a seven day head start to the promised land because Moses didn't say anything about coming back he said we're gonna go three days journey and sacrifice he didn't say and then we'll be back uh, so verse 28 uh, and Pharaoh said, I will let you go that you may sacrifice to the Lord your God in the wilderness, only ye shall not go very far away. And treat for me. So, you know, Pharaoh's leery of what they're up to here. Um, but uh, verse 29, And Moses said, Behold, I will go out from thee, and I will entreat the Lord that the swarms of flies may depart from Pharaoh, from his servants, and from his people tomorrow. But let not Pharaoh deal deceitfully any more in not letting the people go to the sacri uh, to sacrifice to the Lord. Verse 30, And Moses went out from Pharaoh and entreated the Lord. Now, um, the Lord will remove the flies, but Pharaoh's word is lies. I rhymed that on purpose. Verse 31, And the Lord did according to the word of Moses, and he removed the swarm of flies from Pharaoh, from his servants, and from his people. There remained not one. And Pharaoh hardened his heart at this time also, neither would he let the people go. Of course, we knew that ahead of time. That's why there's ten plagues. But uh, just again on this thing about Pharaoh hardened his heart, uh, Haley's Bible Handbook with the King James Version, the classic edition. I want to remind you, if you get a Haley's, get, it doesn't have to be hardback, but make sure it's King James Classic because they've, they've got new ones out with new versions, and they, if it's not a classic, they've changed it, and they've removed and added all kinds of things. But he says, quote, Pharaoh hardened his heart. God hardened Pharaoh's heart. Both did. God's purpose was to make Pharaoh repent. But when a man sets himself against God, even God's mercies result in further hardening. And that's where we close. Next time, chapter 9, and the plagues take on a much more serious detrimental form. God will escalate matters with the number 5, the number of death.